If the Regency era is known for anything, it's usually the decadent lifestyle that members of the gentry got to experience. During this time, class divides were intense, and even among the wealthy there was still a strict social hierarchy that depended on your family and title. The London season, in particular, gave rich families the opportunity to show off their vast amounts of wealth. And what better way to distinguish yourself from the poor than to create intricate rituals surrounding manners that everyone had to follow? Indeed, during the Regency, manners were practically a competitive sport. And perhaps no event showed this off more than the dinner party. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Historodame, and today, we're learning all about how to attend a Regency-era dinner. <laughs> A dinner party during the early 1800s was a great way for members of the elite to flaunt their vast amounts of wealth. These dinners could last for hours, and were considered to be quite a big deal. But behaving properly during a dinner entertainment was expected, and there were so many rules to be aware of that entire books were even written on the subject. Proper behavior for a dinner party begins upon receiving the invitation, which would be sent out anywhere from 3 to 14 days before the event. Since proper notice was given, not attending the event after already accepting the invitation was a cause for great insult. As one etiquette handbook puts it, when an invitation is accepted, let nothing but imperative necessity compel you to break the engagement, or at the last moment to send an excuse. Or in other words, unfortunately for all you introverts out there, there was no cancelling plans last minute. Once the day of the dinner party came around, it was very important that you arrived on time, or even 15 to 30 minutes before dinner was said to begin. Upon entering the house, a proper guest should first greet their hostess, then the master of the house, and then anyone else that was nearby. The number of people that would be in attendance could range depending on the occasion, but around 10 people was considered to be a happy medium. Guests would remain in the drawing room until dinner was ready to be served. John Trussler's 1804 manual, A System of Etiquette, recommends using these few minutes before the meal to make yourself aware of those in attendance, and the order of their rank. That way you would not be confused when later entering the dining room. Even something as simple as walking from the drawing room to the table had a whole list of rules around how it should proceed. Women would enter first, led by the hostess, and followed by the other ladies in order of rank. Gentlemen would proceed afterwards, in the same fashion. Other setups might have had the gentlemen escort the ladies to the table, with partners being pre-assigned based on rank and age. A common arrangement was to have ladies sit at the upper end of the table, while gentlemen were at the lower end. Other times, it might be alternated between men and women. A polite guest would ensure that they were conscious of their actions, even when taking their seat. It was recommended that you sit far enough from the table so that it would not impede your movement, but also close enough so that you did not risk food falling on your clothing while you ate. The food, of course, was the main event of the evening. Fine dining during the Regency era was a grand experience, and was drawn out over several courses, each featuring somewhere between 5 to 25 different dishes. There were two different ways to serve dinner during this time. The first was service à la Française, where multiple dishes would be placed on the table at the same time, and diners would help themselves to the food, similar to a modern-style buffet. In some cases, there were so many different dishes that two people on opposite ends of the table could end up eating entirely different meals from each other, the second was service à la Russe, where dishes were brought out in order, and servants would give a small portion to each person. The first course would have been soup, of which multiple varieties might have been available. One popular choice for the time was white soup, which was made with eggs, broth, cream, and almonds. Unlike multi-course dinners today, the food served in each remove would not be separated based on type. After beginning with the soup, you could expect any type of dish to arrive on the table next, with both sweet and savory foods being served together. Items such as roasted meats, fish, vegetables, savory pies, cheeses, 
raspberry cake, and pudding could all be available at the same time. And I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I would want to mix my asparagus with my cake. All of these dishes would be dressed up with an elaborate presentation. A roast might be decorated with features from the animal, such as the head, ears, or feathers, arranged tastefully around the meat. Vegetables could be displayed in a stack or tower. Pies and cakes would be decorated with fruits and creams, or pressed into a mold to give them an interesting shape. After all, it wasn't enough just to eat the food that was so expensive it cost half of a peasant's yearly salary. They needed to feel fancy while doing it, and presentation was everything. After the main courses had concluded, bowls of rose water would be passed out for the guests to clean their fingers, before the tablecloth was removed and dessert would begin. Common items served might have included nuts, fruit, and ice cream. Throughout some of the courses, a pineapple might have also been present on the table, but it was not for the purpose of eating. This fruit would be mainly used as an ornament to show off how wealthy your host was. If you want to learn more about what made rich people so crazy for pineapples, I've already done a whole video on that. You can find the link in the description. In order to enjoy all that a Regency dinner had to offer, however, one needed to know how to behave properly when eating. In high society, manners were everything, and it could be a great blow to your reputation if you were known to have poor table etiquette. In the case of a French-style dinner, gentlemen were expected to serve the ladies near them any dish that was in reach. But even putting food on a plate could be a minefield if you didn't know the rules. Whenever a serving spoon was available, food should be transferred from the dishes to the plate using that, with a fork acting as a last resort. A person's plate should never be filled too much, especially with highly sought-after items, such as game, and you should never ask to sample the same thing twice, since that would be seen as gluttony. Just ignore the fact that you're eating 25 different dishes for one course, though. If you wanted to access a dish that was far away from you on the table, one should never reach or stand from their chair. Instead, ask a servant to fetch it for you. If something was sent to you specifically from the host or hostess, accept it and do not offer it to anyone else. Eating, of course, should be done with the proper cutlery for each case. The fork was the primary tool for feeding yourself, while the knife acted only as a divider. A spoon could be used for items such as tarts, pudding, curries, and of course soup. When eating soup, however, you had to eat from the side of the spoon, never the front, and be extremely careful not to make any slurping sounds. If it was hot, you had to wait for it to cool down, never blow on it. Food should be eaten at the same pace as the rest of the guests at the table. It was impolite to eat much faster or much slower than anyone else, so one had to be careful to pace themselves based on the people around them. In the case that you experienced the embarrassment of spilling any food on your clothing, remain calm, wipe the worst of it away with your napkin, and then continue on as though nothing is amiss. There is nothing worse than drawing attention to the incident. While eating, it was important that you made conversation with others at the table. Who exactly you were allowed to talk to, however, depended on how formal the event was. A smaller gathering might have conversation that took place across the table, but in a larger group it was more polite to speak with the people directly on either side of you. As you are nearing the end of the meal, keep in mind that it is best to avoid finishing everything on your plate. Remain at the table until everyone is finished and the hostess gives the signal to leave the dining room. Once the meal has ended, ladies would follow the hostess to the drawing room, where they might make conversation, embroider, and perhaps even gossip if they were feeling particularly daring. Gentlemen, on the other hand, would remain in the dining room to enjoy a drink of alcohol and discuss manly things that they firmly believed the women could never understand. After about an hour, the gentlemen would join the ladies in the drawing room. Tea, coffee, or punch might be served, while the guests enjoyed activities such as playing cards or even dancing. It was proper form to engage in the festivities for at least an hour after dinner had concluded, otherwise your host might get the wrong idea that you were there for the food alone, and not their company. 
In many cases, however, these parties would last long into the night. Once you've made it through dinner and your obligatory hour of socializing, you were free to go. The final task that you had to concern yourself with was making sure to visit your host sometime during the week after the party. You should thank them again for the invitation, and talk about how much fun you had. Once that's over, congratulations! You've made it through a formal Regency-era dinner. Hopefully you followed all the rules. That way, no one will be talking about your ghastly manners behind your back. Hey everyone, thank you for watching! If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like or a comment down below. If you want to see more content like this, you can also subscribe to my channel, and keep up to date on all the fun history videos of the future. But for now, I bid you farewell.